Welcome, everybody. Welcome, fellow patriots. Welcome, fellow deplorables. Welcome, fellow rock dwellers. Welcome to the Conservative Commandos radio show. I'm Rick Trader coming to you from the studios of the Conservative Commandos radio network. And joining me today as my co-host is the patriot from the Battleborn State, the Silver State of Nevada, and that's my good friend, Sharon Angle. Sharon, welcome back to Conservative Commandos. Sharon, our first guest is with us. Please make him feel welcome. Well, it's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Sargas Sangari, who is a retired U.S. Army colonel who saw extensive combat in the Middle East as a Special Operations Forces soldier and who, after retirement, continues to advise the fledgling a Syrian Christian army in Iraq known as Dweek Nashwa with his military expertise. Welcome to the Conservative Commandos radio show. It's good to be here, uh, Sharon and Bob. Uh, much appreciated. It's called Dweek Nashwa, and uh, but uh, we'll get into the pieces of of uh, when they operate and where they are today. Dweek Nasha. Okay. <laughs> I I knew I was going to butcher that, and I was afraid I was going to butcher your name as well. But we wanted to ask you on, because you are an expert on uh, military strategy, especially in the Middle East, foreign policy, Assyrians in Iraq and Syria, the U.S. Army, and just kind of what's been going on. And I guess to our great shock... Uh, last weekend, uh, Iran shot down a military drone. Now, it, it's not manned, so we, no one was killed, I guess, but, but it still seems like a very bold play on their part and not very, um, not very friendly. I guess that's my that's my take on it. They they're they're acting like they don't want to be friends anymore and I don't know what this means for the US and and does it mean another war? I mean, I I guess that's the thing that makes us so nervous out here in the heartland. Well, you know, uh we got to take opportunity uh given uh, everything we do within the region. Look, uh when uh, they turned on their radar systems to locate that drone and shoot it down, it gave an opportunity for us to be able to hack into their systems. So uh, U.S. multi is never on standby uh, as far as what is going on. So by the uh, hardliners uh, making the decision to turn on their radars, their systems, it gave us an opportunity as they were shooting down our drone to find out what their array of their forces were. And as uh, you already heard, we were able to conduct cyber attacks within their systems. Uh, so uh, that drone and its shooting cost them dearly when it came on the strategic level when it comes to the array of their forces within the, uh, within the region. Now, this is an internal fight between the uh, hardliners and the uh, uh, moderates, for a better term, and it uh, shows that uh, you know the sanctions are working to an extent. Uh, now, with the president announcing the new sanctions, he's now targeting it at the hardliners specifically, uh, because the shooting down on the drone, uh, from the Iranian perspective, they figured then they can say that, look, uh, we're the only ones who are fighting against the United States. So look at Saudi Arabia. They're not just in cahoots with the U.S., but at the same time, they uh, have a treaty with Israel when it comes to overflights uh, for their airspace is concerned. Uh, so we are the lead for Islam and Saudi ism. So there's an internal fight between Shia and the Sunnis within the region that uh, we really kind of have to be very careful about how we negotiate through that uh, landscape. Well, that's kind of exciting news. I didn't realize that they had really shot themselves in the foot, um, to speak, so to speak, with uh, uh, revealing just how powerful or not powerful they are in that region. And then uh, opening up this whole idea that there's uh, almost a civil war going on so we're we're really not as entangled as I thought we were. We're 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 just kind of a bystander here in this whole situation. Uh, you know, the president and the current POTUS is doing the right thing as far as being patient. I was interviewed a week ago and I called for patience in the process, and it seems like the patience is paying off. When he established the sanctions today against the uh, religious leadership, 
in Iran, it's significant because he's also widening this fight between the moderates and the the uh, uh, hardliners because those assets that he's going to go after, a lot of those assets are sitting in Europe and are sitting in other Western nations. It's possible some of them might be even in the, in the United States. Now, once we go after those assets or the Department of the Treasury goes after them, now the hardliners have to explain to the people of Iran as to, well, if the West is such a great Satan, why is it that you took our money and invested it as a religious leader in the institutions that the West has for your own wants and protections and expansion of your power base? So that also is another way of hitting them. You don't always need to go to war with Iran. You could do it through these processes, which I think shows patience and our ability of understanding how to negotiate within the region politically. Well, and it, it is really a political thing now, isn't it? But it is within that own that Iranian sphere more political than us. Like you said, we're just kind of standing by being patient and watching them uh, try to muddle through what is a real political problem for their country. Uh, it is. Look, uh, we wrote an article on the Near East Center for Strategic Engagement on September 28, 2015, and we uh, said, who speaks for Islam? Who should speak for Islam? There's an internal fight between these Islamic nations. Uh, Turkey was always jockeying to be the lead of uh, Sunni Islam, um, being uh, Erdogan saw himself as being the next uh, sultan of uh, Islam within the region. Saudi Arabia constantly jockeying to be the lead of Sunni Islam itself separates from Turkey, Iran, jockeying to be the lead of Islam for all of Islam, specifically for Shia Islam. And, and in this fight, if we don't choose a side within this uh, discussion, I think we're going to come out uh, much more powerful at the end because we'll allow them to kind of fight the side. Look, even uh, the most recent elections that took place in Turkey, the uh, National Alliance Party uh, brought in 54% of the vote, close to uh, 9 million votes which was a defeat for Erdogan and his aspirations of being the Sultan of Islam in the region. So slowly and slowly, this this capability that these religious and Islamic extremists had held in their countries are starting to unravel. I think it's interesting that you say, let them fight it out, because they don't seem to be a very peaceful uh, set of countries there. They, they kind of uh, go toward that warrior... Uh, position all the time and so getting involved with them we're never going to see a very peaceful settlement it seems like everybody's going to want to fight with somebody and uh, it's interesting that you say that let them fight it out I, uh, will there ever be peace in the Middle East I know that's one of the things that presidents here think is p a possibility I, and even uh, sometimes we hear it from the Ar Israelis that they think peace is possible is it really uh, functional peace is possible, but within that functional peace, uh, sometimes you have to be able to put your foot on the neck of that enemy and just don't let him breathe. Uh, they'll eventually realize that, you know what, it's better to kind of be nice than not be nice. Uh, the I Iranians uh, from day one have always had a desire to have a friendship with the West, the people themselves. You know, you're talking about um, going back before the revolution, Iranians used to eat breakfast in their homes fly to Paris, uh, and this is, we're talking about the business class, fly to Paris, shop, have a late uh, uh, lunch, and then fly back and sleep in their own beds on the same day. And you go from that type of ability to where you are today, and Iranians have always wanted to have a relationship with the West. Now, the moderates have indicated that, look, we're ready to talk, even with shooting down of the drone. The, uh, uh, the, the religious extremists are saying that we're ready to talk because the sanctions are working. Our, our wants and desires were from the beginning when the previous administration struck this, what we call in the Near East, an economic deal with Iran, was to be able to control those markets within that region, especially in Iran, over the next 20, 30 years. And uh, we had written an article going back to January of 2016, where we said that, you know, uh, Europe is saved at the expense of the United States again, because the previous administration struck that deal to really kind of help Europe economically and unfortunately the economically the europeans tried to bypass us business-wise and strike deals that were not uh, supportive of american aspirations within the region which led us to where we are today 
with uh, the current administration pulling out of the agreement. So hopefully with these uh, sanctions going against the Islamic uh, leadership of Iran, you're going to see a lot of those assets sitting in some of the even allied countries, include England, Germany, and France, which now they have to come to the table and say, why are you supporting these type of regimes? And uh, we can we couldn't directly sanction our allies, but we could do it indirectly to make sure that we close the back door, which they were using in order to support Iran. Well, it sounds like a great strategy to me, and uh, and I'm really glad that we've had you on to explain what's going on. Uh, we do have to take a break, and I know that uh, on the other side, Rick will want to continue this line and, and really talk in more depth about what's going on. But we are coming to you from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios and around the world on the Internet with TalkStream Live, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, American Political Radio, Leading Edge Radio Network, and AMA. FM 24-7. And now you can watch our TV show on the AUN TV network in Northern California. We'll be right back with my co-host Rick Trader. I'm Sharon Engel and our guest, Lieutenant Colonel Saras Sergis Sagari, <laughs> who is the U.S. Army Colonel. And we've been talking about the shooting down of the drone by Iran. I saw voter fraud with my own eyes. Now, people say, why didn't you report to the authorities? Well, they were the ones doing it. The integrity of one man, one vote doesn't apply at the Texas state legislature. There is no way to know if your representatives are voting for themselves. Hartman, a Republican, reaches back to vote for Democrat Oliveda. Democrat Matt Reynolds votes for Republican England. Two out of three voters nationwide believe that voter fraud is a serious problem in the U.S. today. The process is rigged. Both sides of the aisle are, are guilty. Florida now has to tell the Department of Justice whether the state will comply with DOJ's demand to stop purging thousands of people from its voter rolls. We have the sloppiest election system of any industrialized democracy. Philadelphia flagged 50,000 uh, duplicate registration, so just think how many more slipped through. It's almost impossible to detect. How do you get caught? You only get caught if you confess. Election corruption is deeply embedded in America. Quote, election fraud is a crime that usually pays, unquote, writes Tracy Campbell in his book, Deliver the Vote, a history of election fraud, an American political tradition from 1742 to 2004. In 1742, the first Prime Minister of Britain in the American colonies, Robert Walpole, was forced to resign. We have a right not to have our vote canceled out by someone who shouldn't be voting, someone who's an illegal alien, someone who's a felon not eligible to vote, someone who doesn't exist. If they vote, they cancel your vote out as much as if you're prevented from voting. this is going to be fixed, it's going to have to be a citizen effort. It comes down to, it's the same old question, uh, if not now, when? If not us, then, then who? This is huge. This is about the democracy and the principles of the United States of America. People say, but why you? Why you? Why, well, well, why not? And if it starts with a fireman, if it starts with a sanitation worker, if it starts with a teacher or a nurse or a caretaker of the elderly, then so be it. It's got to start somewhere. But it's time we come together and fix this problem once and for all. There is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even you could even rig America's elections. To say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie. allegations of voter fraud, the claims raising questions about the... Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and 32 others were on a military plane that crashed today in a violent storm. There are no known survivors at this time. The U.S. Army was funded by the evil entity. Well, voter fraud with my own eyes. To say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie. The process is rigged.
Thank you for staying with us. This is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. I'm Rick Trader. My co-host today is Sharon Angle. I want to give a shout out to the folks who listen to us on radio stations in Jacksonville, Tampa, and Villages, Florida, Las Vegas, and Reno, Macon, Georgia, Lancaster, and Pittsburgh, Boulder, and Colorado Springs, Milwaukee, Long Beach, California, Arlington, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and also seen on the AUN television network in places like San Francisco, San Jose. Jose and Sacramento. I want to thank our guest for staying with us, and he is Lieutenant Colonel Sargas Sangari. He's a retired U.S. military colonel. And by the way, Colonel, before we uh, get back into the interview, I do want to thank you for your service to our country. God bless you for that. Uh, thank you very much. Well, you know, Colonel, it's not just been the shooting down of this drone. There have been tankers that have been attacked by by Iran in the Straits of Hermes, but it seems like those uh, tanker attacks did not get the get the pressure and notoriety of this drone attack, even though that I see one as just as bad as the other. And what's your take on that? Why was the attack on the drone the um, the straw that broke the camel's back? Um, it was because we realized that uh, by lashing out that the uh, that the sanctions we had are working again i went back to the previous segment where really our allies are really undercutting us uh to be honest um, um i mean it was so bad that you know when we struck the deal under the previous administration the first group of businessmen that arrived in iran to negotiate were the oil companies uh and as soon as they left the europeans followed well, the Europeans were going in and some of the major companies that the Europeans had were going in and in certain uh, meetings, believe it or not, they were actually, you know, uh, giving money to protesters on the ground to scream uh, debt to America. And then they were wow. turning around to the Iranian businessmen saying, look, your own folks are screaming debt to America. Why would you want to strike a economic deal with the American companies? Why don't you have the American companies go through us? Which really kind of undercut us uh, in the region. And then now you take some of our allies, like Turkey in this case, being a NATO country that is all having a lot of the movement of trade that goes through Iran into Europe. So this was significant for us because not only did it give us a tactical advantage on the ground, also at the same time gave an opportunity for us to be able to place the sanctions on the individuals we needed to place on because you cannot go higher than the supreme leader of Iran to finalize the sanctions that had started even going back under the previous administration. Colonel, when you say we're being undercut by uh, allies, please name names, number one. Number two, what can we do to bring our allies in line? Do, can well, the president, are, are there any pressures that the president can use against them? Yeah, he's already doing it. I mean, you couldn't go out and say, I'm going to put sanctions against certain British or German or French companies. But uh, he specifically went out and put pressures against individuals within the government of Iran that have actually assets that are sitting within those companies or those countries, mm -hmm. I should say, which now will shine a light on those countries and will have the people in those countries say, hey, look, why are you holding assets for a, a terrorist regime like Iran in these hardliners in our country? I mean, there's going to be a understanding of what national security is and what uh, business is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think part of what the current administration did, which was a positive, they were able to utilize the relationship that Iran had with Japan going back through even the sanctions and the war, Iran-Iraq war, where Japan really, Iran has a, um, uh, a Japanese-based economy, uh, although China has put a lot of their, uh, you know, uh, economic assets uh, in Iran. Iranians are not interested in Chinese goods. Maybe Americans mm -hmm. are, but Iranians aren't. They always wanted to have a Western style, a lifestyle. So because of that, Japan uh, can become a very key asset for us globally, too, as we mm -hmm. fight against China, Russia, and even some of our allies in the region. Colonel, this uh, drone was four hours into its flight. Did Iran have any way of knowing that if this, this was a manned or unmanned aircraft? Uh, yes, they had. Um, look, we've had multiple drones that have flown actually over the territory of Iran. Iran never hit them. This was the first time that they went ahead and turned on their signatures. We had something in the U.S. Army. We called it uh, movement to contact. And movement to contact is where you just move through the 
field, make a lot of noise, let the enemy find out where you are, shoot at you so you understand what where they are and what their capabilities are. And uh, if you want to compare it to only, almost like a movement to contact, sometimes you put a big target out there where they're just itching to hit it. And by hitting it, you're able to find all their other arrays when in the battlefield. And, uh, you know, like I said, it led to us having the ability to get into their systems. If they hadn't shot down at that drone, we probably wouldn't have been able to maybe backdoor some of their systems to be able to conduct our cyber attacks. So I think it uh, it paid its uh, way in, uh, in the price as far as that drone going down. Okay. Well, you talk about our allies. What about our allies in the areas like the Arabs? Uh, the the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, I mean specifically, uh, it seems like there have been conflicts between Iran and Saudi Arabia for some time. Uh, should the Saudi Arabians be playing a bigger part in uh, it, in our efforts there? Well, the problem with Saudi Arabia is the only thing Saudi Arabia can do is write checks. You know, that's the only muscle they've been able to flex within the region. Uh, when I was in Iraq, in Iraq uh, and uh, we're talking about 06, 07, mm-hmm. if you walked into an uh, Iraqi Shia garrison, you would see the pictures of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, and you would see pictures of uh, the various different prophets in the, uh, from the Shiite side of the house. Uh, Iran has always been able to muster that type of a ability, has that muscle within the various different countries. That's why he's able to operate in Syria and Iraq and uh, Lebanon, uh, Saudi Arabia, again, like I said, as it tries to jockey to be the leader of Islam, uh, holding all the institution of Islam specifically within its borders, has never been able to do that except the ability of the oil that gives them the ability to write the checks to influence what it thinks is foreign policy for the best interests of its kingdom rather than anyone else. If you take a look mm-hmm. at Iran's ability, they're able to motivate a small um, capability in Yemen, a tribal group within months is able to shoot down uh, Navy ships uh, if, if need be off the coast of Yemen and attack Saudi airport capabilities. That particular type of a sense of Shiism uh, exists only in the ability of Iran to project that where Saudi is not capable of doing that. Colonel, I, I'm, I for one think we're still paying the price for weak presidency in Jimmy Carter. And could it be that we are having the type of tensions we are with Iran because of another weak president, uh, that of Barack Obama? Oh, you know, everything's kind of tied together. The, the unfortunate piece was uh, President Obama tried to strike this economic deal that really wasn't going to pay off. There was a piece that you wrote on the Near East that talked about power relations. And uh, we bought, under the previous administration, we bought into the concept that the Chinese are proposing for a two-world order, basically, within, within the region. Well, Iran is part of that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Unfortunately, uh, you got to understand that uh, the nature of the countries you're dealing with has always been there. It will never change. And uh, sometimes I think what happens our politicians get sucked into these you know, ideas that it's possible to have effects and changes on others, and it's not going to happen. Unfortunate problem we run into right now, once the current administration walked away from an agreement, Iran now is stuck because Iran can come to the table and go, okay, you want me to strike an agreement with you, but what is it that gives me assurances that the next administration is not going to come in and break that agreement? So either we have to get to a treaty to finally solve this issue that is going back to Jimmy Carter, or are we going to be constantly in this endless loop unless the moderates are able to finally take power and uh, replace the, the uh, hardliners in Iran? Our guest here on the Conservative Commandos radio show is Sargis Sangari, um, for, uh, retired lieutenant colonel, U.S. Army. Uh, colonel, you're running for Congress in Illinois. Why are you, why are you running? Well, I, I haven't announced it officially, but thank you very much for announcing it officially. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's just going but the show notes that were provided to us. That's uh, okay. I, I didn't think know I was, me. <laughs> didn't know we were jumping the gun here. But uh, if you were to run, why would you run? Well, I, I did run. I, I ran, and part of it was because uh, I'll be honest. I was in a uh, I was in a meeting uh, where they, they part, one of the uh, 
uh, the part, uh, the the uh, National Security Council all had put pressure on a uh, State Department saying you need to send your deputy down there to talk to Colonel Singer in Chicago. And when the gentleman walked in, uh, said, "Why are you meeting with me? Why do I have to meet with you?" I said, "Because there was a document that was placed on your desk and you never read it." And he goes, uh, "One day was a place on my desk." I said, "On this date at this time," <laughs> and you opened it and you read it. Now, here we are, four months later, you haven't done anything about it, and you don't know anything about it. It took six years of Americans sacrificing to get to that point. Yes, it took us a weekend to get there and get it done, but where are we going to be? And I realized after that, I came home and I told my wife, I'm, I'm tired of this, uh, and I decided to run for office. We ran for five months uh, and got close to 8,000 votes. So since then, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on me. Um, we are definitely looking at uh, announcements sometime in the next couple of months unless things change because uh, I just think that if you don't have a place at the table, it's just not going to get done. Uh, the way we're structured politically is awful. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, you know, you got one administration strikes a deal that nobody likes, the other one comes and cancels it. Uh, we can't do a foreign policy this way. We have to get Congress to do what they need to do to ensure that we don't get to these points where the different executives are constantly coming in and jockeying back and forth to try to run our foreign policy from the executive branch. All right. What uh, what district is that in Illinois? Uh, it's the ninth uh, congressional uh, district. I'm running as a Republican against a you know, 20 year incumbent. So uh, I decided to choose the hardest fight possible because I think it's, it's doable. Uh, the Assyrian community has a large uh, uh, numbers here, unfortunately, like a lot of immigrant communities and even the communities that we have that are even American communities registered historically here, a lot of them aren't voting. If they register and vote, uh, it's easy to flip a couple of the uh, key uh, uh, villages that exist within the 9th Congressional District, and it will be an easy victory come uh, November of next year. Go ahead. 9th District, what area of uh, Illinois is that? Uh, well, that's the Janschkowski district. We're looking at uh, Lincolnwood, Skokie. Um, I mean, it's a large district, um, um, you know, parts of Chicago. So it's, it's it's a large gerrymandered district. And probably <laughs> will get you gerrymandered after this election. Anyway. All right. Sargas and Gary, we want to thank you so much for joining us here in Conservative Commandos. Again, thank you and God bless you for your service to our country. People want to know more about uh, what's going on in Iran. How could they follow you? Uh, they could uh, 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 read about us uh, on the Near East Center for Strategic Engagement. And uh, one piece that we established uh, to support the Christian force structures on the ground that it was initially mentioned during the opening um, and support their families as a United Assyrian Appeal which is a 501c3, and that's what we had to establish it because there was no money or support going for the Christian military families or the uh, capabilities on the ground. We have removed those forces since then from the battlefield because we don't want to get stuck between the Kurds and the Arabs killing each other. Uh, another, right. uh, you know, historical uh, animosity there. But uh, it's that force structure is capable to come back any time the current uh, leadership decides that we want to give the Christians their own province just like everybody else and have them secure their own future well colonel if you want to know about running running in tough districts you want to talk to the lady that's joining us today <laughs> she's had a lot of experience running up against people like harry reed i bet she'd have a lot of great uh, advice and information for, for you but again we want to thank you so much for joining us here on conservative commandos hope you come back again Thank you very much, and thank you for announcing my wrong for Congress. I appreciate we it. break news here in Conservative <laughs> Commandos. Listen, anytime you want to come back and talk about your vision, we'd love to have you here. Seriously, I mean that. Well, do if anybody asks who push you over the uh, cliff, I'll say the Conservative <laughs> Commandos. <laughs> hey, great place, great place. And you are I'll listening stand. and watching the Conservative Commandos radio show with Sharon Angle and yours truly, Rick Trader. On the other side, we're going to be speaking with our longtime friend. I won't say our very old friend, but our long-term friend, Frank Fernuccio, about illegal, illegal alien impact on the 2020 elections. Don't away sharon and i will be right back with our next guest have you been leasing a property for your business or renting storage space are you tired of paying rent year after year 
Call the experts at General Steel to own a building at up to 30% off now. I'd been renting a building and paying someone else's mortgage, but General Steel showed me how I could own a space tailored to the needs of my business and for less than renting. Call General Steel now at the number on your screen for our current building specials and to price your metal building system today. My building's the dream I've had since finishing my house 14 years ago. I've been using it for a garage, workshop, and storage area for my tools and equipment, and I can't believe how great it turned out. The economy is improving, and the price of steel is expected to rise. Stop waiting. It could cost you thousands. Call General Steel now to see how you can own for less than you thought. Stop waiting to start your business or expand your operation. Call General Steel now. Call 877-484-7002. Everybody wants cheap airfare, but where do you find it? You call low-cost airlines. Their prices are direct from the airlines, and they're so low you can't find these fares published anywhere. They specialize in cheap flights, discount hotel rooms, cheap car rental rates, and great package deals anywhere around the world. Wherever you want to go, they can help you get there cheaply and with the best price guarantee. If you want the lowest prices on your airline tickets or other travel services, call now. That's right, call. That's the only way to get these rates. Experts are standing by 24-7 to get you the cheapest airfare and hotel rates available. So don't wait. Call right now for the lowest travel prices anywhere and for great last-minute travel deals, too. Call 888-431-0562. That's 888-431-0562. 888-431-0562. Friend, do you remember when it felt good to withdraw your cash from the bank to expand a business, go on vacation, or buy a new car? Well, today, withdrawing your own cash has become a very risky business, according to The Secret War, a shocking new research report. I just read it, and folks, I was amazed to learn why banks are now required to spy on us for the government and then report any suspicious or unusual behavior. I suggest you get The Secret War free. Just call the number on the screen, no charge, from the folks at Swiss America and get this. Did you know simply spending cash today may be enough to have you branded as a potential criminal? That's right. The new war on cash is really a war against all freedom-loving Americans. The Secret War is yours free, so call the number on the screen and you can tell them. Pat Boone gave you the number. And this is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. I'm Rick Trader. My co-host today is Sharon Angle. Yes, that's Sharon Angle. And for rebroadcast, please check out our website, ccrshow.com. That's ccrshow.com. Also, like us, friend us, and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. On Twitter, it's CC, CC Show. CC Show will find us on Twitter. And on Facebook, yes. Facebook relented and we're back on Facebook. It is the Conservative Commandos radio show. And Sharon, with that, we have a very longtime friend joining us. I won't call him an old friend. I'll say longtime friend of Conservative Commandos. Please make him feel welcome. Well, it's a great pleasure always to introduce our friend, Frank Vernuccio, who serves as the editor-in-chief of the New York Analysis of Policy and Government, providing objective coverage of key issues facing the United States today. Frank is the co-host of the Vernuccio Novak Report, nationally both on radio broadcast and on the web, amfm247.com. Frank also co-hosts the American Political Zone broadcast on cable in Eastern Connecticut. And in the aftermath of the 9-11 attack, Frank was appointed by New York's Governor George Pataki to lead the hard-hit New York County Workers' Compensation Board. Frank, welcome back to the Conservative Commandos radio show. It's great to be with friends again. <laughs> it's always great to have you, Frank. And, and, of course, you've written a great article, Illegal Alien Impact on the 2020 Election, here in Nevada. We're very concerned about 2020 for a multitude of reasons. We turned blue uh, this last cycle through uh, both houses and the governor's 
mansion, our blue, plus all of our constitutional offices, which means we got a plethora, a boatload of liberal lawmaking and lawmakers in our last um, uh, legislative uh, cycle here in Nevada, which is just scary to the max. But the more important scariness is that we are looking at 2020 being the census year. And in 2001, we will be reapportioning. And at that point, we could, if we still have that Democrat-controlled government, we could be looking at 10 more years of Democrat-controlled government strictly because of gerrymandering uh, during that um, reapportionment process. So this idea of what's important, who's running on what, what the policies are going to be, can Trump win your state? He didn't win Nevada last time. So, I mean, it, it's just really a very poignant question that you raise. What's the impact? And, and as we know, I think we know this, but I want you to say it. Is the immigration conflict the number one issue in the United States? Well, I think it is. And let's just talk about that 2020 election for a second. We know that there have been numerous cases where, particularly in places like California, where there have been elections where Republicans have lost seats or lost uh, positions when there were more people voting than there were registered voters. Can I say that again? More people voting than there were registered voters. Now, in every case where that occurs, it seems the Democrat is capturing a Republican seat. California also, as has New York just this week, authorized the issuance of driver's licenses to illegal aliens. Why is that important? Because when you register to vote, the piece of identification they ask you for is a driver's license. Now, historically, immigrants coming to the United States have at least for the first generation or two been pretty solidly Democrat voters. Uh, the Democrats promise things, and that sounds great to people who are somewhat needy. They're just getting their lives established in the United States. But it was always balanced out by the fact that the next generation or the older generation of immigrants, when they started to see how things really work in the United States, they became somewhat entrepreneurial. They decided, well, you know, the, the Democrats weren't doing a good job, so they wound up voting on the other side. They voted Republican. But this year, Sharon, we're looking at 100,000 illegals coming over the border each and every month. And we know, and let's be really blunt about this. I know it's not polite or politically correct to say it, but let's be blunt. We know that Democrat administrations across the country are doing everything possible to prevent any kind of safety in voter registration. They want those illegals to vote and they want them to vote in huge numbers. Here's one of the reasons why they're so desperate to do that. If you look at the traditional Democrat support, ethnic Catholics, let's start with those guys. Um, we know that the Democrats have frequently made comments, Camilla Harris of California, for example, that Catholics perhaps shouldn't sit on the bench because they have a religious view on abortion. Uh, they've also said that basically our longtime alliance with Israel should be thrown out the window. So that traditional support to the Democrat Party is jeopardized. Interestingly enough, we're hearing from black leaders across the country that a lot of black voters may either vote for Trump or sit on their hands when it comes to pulling that lever for president because they have been dissatisfied by the fact that Democrats have not done well for black voters, financially especially, and the lowest rate of unemployment in American history came under the Trump administration. You could also look at some of the uh, social issues where the black community is far closer to Donald Trump than they are to the uh, extreme leftists in the Democrat Party. Blue collar workers, no president ever went out of their way to protect the jobs of blue collar workers more than Donald Trump, another bastion formerly of support for the Democrat Party. So if you're losing all of these core voters, you got to get support from someplace and in their desperation, the Democrat Party is looking at those 1,200,000 um, illegals coming into the country this year and the ones who came in in previous years and seeing a fertile field 
of potential votes. And that's why they are so desperate to get those votes. Now, what's fascinating is at the same time that Democrats have said, well, you shouldn't have to show any kind of picture ID when you go to vote. Remember, and we've talked about this before, in the Philadelphia Democrat Convention in 2016, to get on the floor of the Democrat Convention as a delegate, what did you have to do? You had to show Shut picture up, ID. ID. Yeah. <laughs> Unreal. Well, I'm glad you're bringing up the idea of fraud because uh, it's really near and dear to my heart. I have had a direct occasion to have fraud committed in elections against me. And, uh, and as we looked out across the nation starting to investigate this, we know that it's at least 3% in every state. And now it's verging on 10 and possibly 20% in some states. And when you mention California, we get to benefit from their fraudulent votes. Um, you know, Judicial Watch with the extreme help of the documentation done by the Election Integrity Project of California, uh, was able to settle out of court with L.A. County for 1.9 million fraudulent votes. They just said, yeah, you're right, we did it. So when, mm. when we talk about Nevada, uh, we know that those fraudulent votes come across that state line. And it goes both ways. It's a talk about porous borders. We know that they vote in Cali from Nevada in California's uh, elections, and we know that Californians come into Nevada and vote in our elections. And we even have names. So this is not just uh, some kind of speculation. We know this happens. And so uh, you know when you mention this. Uh, and a fraudulent vote doesn't necessarily mean a person doesn't exist, but uh, there are those non-existent folks, too. We, we know about the folks that live on abandoned, uh, in abandoned warehouses and on uh, vacant lots and things like that. But more importantly, we're now talking about folks that are not citizens. That is a fraudulent vote. If you're not a citizen, you're not allowed to vote in our elections. That qualifies you to vote and is one of the benefits of citizenship and why we say to any immigrant that's coming into our United States, we want you to be citizens. Just go through the proper channels. Just do it right. Just do it the legal way. But that's not how uh, the Democrats want to do it. They're wanting to backdoor us. And, and I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because it is a factor. It has been a factor that I know of since um, at least before uh, 2010. I know in 2009 we were seeing evidences of it even then. So um, when we talk about this, this is, this is a big deal. And you have got statistics in your article that mm -hmm. show what a big deal this is just just give us a few of those numbers frank well if you look overall i mean the 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 numbers just the financial burden you know the difference before is that people came to the united states and it was their intention to contribute to the United States through their labor as much as they were getting back from being here but since we changed the principles of what financial benefits people coming into the country are eligible for we're now getting a group of people in significant numbers that are coming here not to be part of the united states not to help the economy of the united states as well as helping themselves there's nothing wrong with that but actually to glean the benefits of those benefits when you're talking about let's go back to our example of california california has just voted legislation which will provide free health care to, uh, to certain numbers of illegal aliens. In New York State, um, there are benefits that will go to illegals. Interestingly enough, in New York State, if you, let's say, are a New Jersey son or daughter of a veteran who was killed in combat protecting the United States, you are not qualified for discount tuition in New York State. But if you are an illegal alien living in the United States, living in New York, you are eligible for that discount. Outrageous. You know, so you're seeing a different type of people come to the United States. You're also seeing, in another way, that the economy is not being helped by all this, remittances. 
Um, a lot of people in the past, most immigrants when they came, would invest their money. They'd send some home, but they'd also invest in buying a business, buying property, uh, becoming part of the American economic mainstream. Now you're seeing huge number of remittances. This has been going on for quite a while, going back to Mexico or Central America or other places. So we're seeing a real difference in the economic profile of the folks coming into the United States and what benefits that mm. have to the people of the United States. Well, well and we need to go to a break now, Frank, but I want to get into this on the other side. I know that uh, Rick will. We are coming to you from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network Studios and around the world on the Internet with TalkStream Live, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, American Political Radio, Leading Edge Radio Network, and uh, AM FM 24-7. You can also watch us on our TV show at the AUN Network Show Network TV uh in San Francisco, San Rafael, Sacramento, many of the Northern California cities. Rick, my co-host, Rick Trader, and I, Sharon Angle, will be right back with our guest, Frank Vernuccio, who is the editor-in-chief of the New York Analysis of Policy and Government, talking about the illegal alien impact on the 2020 election. I saw voter fraud with my own eyes. Now, people say, why didn't you report to the authorities? Well, they were the ones doing it. The integrity of one man, one vote doesn't apply at the Texas state legislature. There is no way to know if your representatives are voting for themselves. Hartman, a Republican, reaches back to vote for Democrat Oliveda. Democrat Matt Reynolds votes for Republican England. Two out of three voters nationwide believe that voter fraud is a serious problem in the U.S. today. The process is rigged. Both sides of the aisle are, are guilty. Florida now has to tell the Department of Justice whether the state will comply with DOJ's demand to stop purging thousands of people from its voter rolls. We have the sloppiest election system of any industrialized democracy. Philadelphia flagged 50,000 duplicate registrations, so just think how many more slipped through. It's almost impossible to detect. How do you get caught? You only get caught if you confess. Election corruption is deeply embedded in America. Quote, election fraud is a crime that usually pays, unquote, writes Tracy Campbell in his book, Deliver the Vote, a history of election fraud, an American political tradition from 1742 to 2004. In 1742, the first Prime Minister of Britain in the American colonies, Robert Walpole, was forced to resign. We have a right not to have our vote canceled out by someone who shouldn't be voting, someone who's an illegal alien, someone who's a felon not eligible to vote, someone who doesn't exist. If they vote, they cancel your vote out as much as if you're prevented from voting. This is going to be fixed. It's going to have to be a citizen effort. It comes down to it's the same old question. Um, if not now, when? If not us, then then who? This is huge. This is about the democracy and the principles of the United States of America. People say, but why you? Why you? Why, well, well, why not? And if it starts with a fireman, if it starts with a sanitation worker, if it starts with a teacher or a nurse or a caretaker of the elderly, then so be it. It's got to start somewhere. But it's time we come together and fix this problem once and for all. There is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even you could even rig America's elections. But to say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie. allegations of voter fraud the claims raising questions about the Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and 32 others were on a military plane that crashed today in a violent storm there are no known survivors at this time the US army was funded by the evil entity or voter fraud with my own eyes to say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie the process is rigged
And thank you for staying with us. Once again, this is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with Sharon Angle and yours truly, Rick Trader. And once again, for rebroadcast of our show, I guess you could check out our website. That's the best place to go. CCRshow.com. That's CCRshow.com. And uh, you'll find rebroadcasts of our radio show or TV show there. A lot of terrific articles and a lot of terrific information. Frank Fernuccio is our guest. He is the editor-in-chief of the New York Analyst of Policy and Government. He's also the co-host of the American Political Zone. And if Frank looks familiar, the American Political Zone can be seen on the AUN television network. Frank, thank you for holding through that break. We appreciate your time. Great being with you. Frank, this is a terrific article. The the statistics that you have found here. Uh, you know, Frank, what I do is when I have a guest on, I go through and I print out the article and I mark it up all what I think are the... <laughs> you see all that yellow? I mean, <laughs> terrific article there, Frank. And, and I wanted to talk about some of the things that you mentioned in here. For that, I'll need my glasses, so bear with me on that. The Federation for American Immigration Reform outlined fiscal burden imposed on the U.S. taxpayers by illegal immigrants at the federal, state, and local uh, levels. Taxpayers shell out approximately $134.9 billion to cover the cost incurred by the presence of 12.5 million illegal aliens and about 4.2 citizen children of illegal aliens, amounting to a tax burden of approximately $8,000 per illegal alien family. Frank, that's like hitting the lottery. Yeah, it certainly is. And 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 when you talk about they're getting free food, free housing, free cell phones, free medical care, free heat... I mean, my gosh, this is better than buying a lottery ticket, Frank Vernuccio. Yeah, it certainly is. And one of the fascinating things about all that, of course, is that there are breakdowns that illegal alien families absorb much more federal, state, and local assistance than native-born and legal resident families do. So you're talking about not just coming in and sharing the benefits that legal residents and citizens get. You're talking about getting benefits far and above what the American citizen and legal residents are getting. You know, there there, there are other aspects as well. If you look at the, again, the contributions, how does that money go back into the economy? Well, we keep hearing the argument, well, they pay taxes too. The taxes they pay is minuscule compared to the benefits they're getting. Frank, I wanted to ask you one thing that wasn't in your article. How much of this money is going back south of our border, our southern border? How much of this money is going back to Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras? You know, any idea of that? I haven't seen an exact dollar amount, but I understand that the proportions are absolutely substantial. So substantial, in fact, that in the case of Mexico, Mexico's second highest source of income after oil is remittances from Mexicans living in the United States. Hey, Sharon and Frank, I just figured out a way to pay for the wall. Let's put a 25% levy on all money, all money transfers going out of the country. Frank, also in your article, and I think it's important to get this out, a general accounting office study of the 55,322 incarcerated illegal, illegal aliens found that they were arrested at least a total of, get this, 459,000 times, averaging about eight arrests per illegal alien. Right. Frank, you know, I'm talking about the hitting the lottery. I mentioned welfare, food stamps, free housing, free cell phones. But then the cost to incarcerate... Right. And let's for let's forget the cost. What about the hardships? The hardships by all this crime being perpetuated by these people that are here illegally. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and you know, the fiction that we hear from the left is that oh these poor folks, the dad gets separated from the family. Well, you know, Rick, you know, Sharon, 
if I went out and knocked off my local 7-Eleven, I would be separated from my family because I was incarcerated for breaking the law. No one would cry about that, but if an illegal alien does it, gets arrested, he's separated from his family. How could we be so terribly cruel to do that? Give me a break. Frank, also in your article, and you and Sharon alluded a little bit to it, but I wanted to put names on this. Let's talk about the 1996 California election involving Loretta Sanchez. Tell us that story. Well, Loretta Sanchez was running against a Democrat, uh, Republican incumbent named Bob Dornan, a very good congressman, by the way. One of uh, my she, favorites, B1 Bob. I love yeah, him. absolutely. And uh, she beat Bob by uh, 984 votes. Well, it turns out, though, that investigators found evidence of 748 illegal votes by non-citizens. I think that was probably just the tip of the iceberg. Those were the ones they could very easily find. Very Yeah. Exactly. And you're seeing that across the country. You know, there are a number of states, particularly this year, in this 2020 election, that are going to be real tight. Let's take Michigan, for example. Michigan's going to be right on the line. Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is going to be right on the line. So you don't have to have, you know, five million illegals voting to tip the state to the Democrat side of the Electoral College. You can have less than a 1,000 that could actually tip it in a close race. The same could be said, by the way, for the state of Florida. That, too, could be tipped by just a couple of hundred votes. This is not an accidental strategy or an oversight on the part of the Democratic Party. This is strategy, pure, simple, and established. Hey, Frank, in your article, you talk about... uh Uh, non-citizens to obtain valid social security numbers and driver's license. What about those that don't get social security numbers and driver's license? What about those committing voter fraud? Do you have any statistics uh, talking about, or not voter fraud, identity theft, identity theft? In in your research, have you thought of it? Have you uh, come up with any statistics involving identity theft by these here by these people that are here illegally on the rest of us. Well, I have seen FBI statistics on identity theft. It's a soaring crime, as you well know. I don't believe the FBI statistics, however, break it down in terms of uh, perpetrator. So I don't have those numbers. But again, it is certainly one way that we're going to see that happen. By the way, just a personal experience. I renewed my driver's license. The eight years were up. I went to the um, DMV, God help me. And I renewed it. Um, I showed my driver's license. I showed my social security card. I showed my passport. I showed everything else. Um, Under the New York State law, none of those things are going to be necessary for an illegal to vote to get a driver's license. They're not going to have a social security card. They're not going to have a U.S. passport. So that's going to make it easier for an illegal to get a driver's license than it was for me to renew mine. Now, there's another aspect of that as well. If you or I, if I'm going to go out and visit Sharon in Nevada, um, and I want to get on that airplane, I've got to show U.S. identification. I've got to show my driver's license, my passport, something along those lines. Now, it's been established that if an illegal is flying, since they don't have those, they can show a letter from a court saying that you have to show up for your hearing, which means, once again, it is easier to get oh things God. done as an illegal than it is as a United States citizen. Oh, by the way, Frank Frank and Sharon, just before CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, I, I ordered business cards at Staples. I paid for them, prepaid for them with a credit card. I did this all online. All I had to do was go to the local Staples and pick it up. You know what they wanted? They wanted picture identification to pick up business <laughs> cards I paid for in advance. You know what I said to them? I don't have a car. I don't have a photo ID because I'm an illegal. That stopped all questions. I was given my business cards. Hey, Frank, we got to run. Always enjoy having you here on Conservative Commandos. Please tell our audience how they can follow your work. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you read you really need to get Frank's article and read it, share it, pass it pass it on. Frank, please tell our audience how they could follow what you do. 
most importantly, watch conservative commandos. Uh, the other way to do it, uh, you can do it at any time. Go to usagovpolicy.com. In addition to our radio and TV show, you'll get our new research column six days a week at that site. All right, Frank Fernuccio, thank you so much for joining us. Take care and God bless. It was great being with you. And this is the Conservative Commandos Radio Show with Sharon Angle and yours truly, Rick Trader. AMFM 24-7 Roku Channel broadcasts all of our shows on demand. To ensure reliability, we store and stream our content on the same servers as Netflix and Amazon. Our Roku channel is free to use, and anyone owning one of the more than 10 million Roku devices can watch our channel at no cost whatsoever. If you have a television show or are thinking about producing a show, you can be a part of AMFM 24-7's Roku channel. Watch our great shows on your Roku device. It's free and more reliable than cable TV. Are you stuck with a timeshare? Did you attend the presentation and were seduced and enticed into buying that great vacation and investment? Now you're in the terrible position of trying to figure out a way to get out of that mess. You're not alone. For over 15 years, BuyYourTimeshare.com has been helping people like yourself get out of timeshare ownership. The fact is there is no resale market. Unscrupulous telemarketers call you and say they have buyers waiting, and the next thing that happens is you give them hundreds of dollars for an ad, and you'll never hear from them again. Another fact is that an identical timeshare to yours is being offered on eBay for a dollar, and no one is buying it. If you want out of your timeshare, I urge you to go to buyyourtimeshare.com or call them at 877-94-HELP-ME. That number again is 877-94-HELP-ME. Buyyourtimeshare.com. That's buyyourtimeshare.com. 877-94-HELP-ME. Dish TV is better than cable TV. Here's why. Dish has the nation's lowest TV price, along with an award-winning DVR that can skip commercials, record eight shows at once, and get access to thousands of movies at your fingertips. Cable simply can't even compare. So the smart choice is to cut the cable and get Dish. Plus, you get all these great TV features, free HD DVR upgrade, free installation, and free movie channels. Say goodbye to cable and get more with Dish TV. 877-290-7764. 877-290-7764. As an added bonus, you can switch to Dish now and receive a $50 Visa gift card. So call now and get Dish TV. Call 877-290-7764, 877-290-7764. That's 877-290-7764. Limited time offer, 24-month commitment, and credit qualification required. Cancellation fee, monthly equipment fees, and other restrictions apply. Promotion can change at any time. And welcome back. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos Radio Show. I'm Rick Trader. My co-host today is Sharon Angle. Yes, that Sharon Angle. And for rebroadcasts of our show, please check out our website, ccrshow.com. That's ccrshow.com. You'll find our radio show there, our TV show there, a lot of terrific articles and great information. Sharon, our first guest, is with us. He's uh, getting to be a longtime friend of the show. As usual, please make him feel welcome. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor also to introduce Michael Bussler, who is the public policy analyst analyst and a professor of finance at Stockton University, where he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in finance and economics. He has written op-ed columns in major newspapers for more than 35 years. Michael, welcome back to the Conservative Commandos radio show. Hi, Rick and Sharon. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's always fun to talk about some of these things, especially when they kind of spring up overnight on us. Uh, The Democrats are debating now, and they are going to be talking about free college tuition and uh, canceling all the student loan debts. Uh, how does that strike you? I mean, you you have uh, two dogs in this in this fight. You being a college professor, that's your livelihood right there. Uh, maybe that's a good thing, maybe not. But the other thing is, as an economist, this must strike you as well. So, talk to us a little bit about uh, it, should should we be more uh, open to this idea? No. <laughs> I think this in a word. End of interview. <laughs> <laughs> <That answers it. laughs> 
<laughs> I think this, this is a terrible idea. You're talking, uh, depending on, uh, Elizabeth Warren wants to pay off about 95% of the debt. Um, Bernie Sanders is talking about a whole 100, 100% of it, roughly $2 trillion that, that will cost. So the question is, where's that money going to come from? Well, they're going to tax people. Uh, they say they're only going to tax the, the wealthy. Uh, that won't be enough. But even if you just tax the wealthy, that's going to harm the economy. Now, why is that? Because when you tax the wealthy $2 trillion, you're removing um, funds that they would use for investment purposes, for creating capital for expansion. We have a capital intensive economy. That means we need capital to grow the economy. Manufacturing jobs that are coming back are all setting up manufacturing facilities with robots and artificial intelligence. And that's the only way we can compete uh, with the lower labor costs in, in, in Asia. Well, in order to be able to expand the economy, we need capital. Even the service sector, everybody has capital equipment to work with. If you reduce the amount of capital being created, you're going to slow down economic growth, and that's harmful to, to everyone. Also, look, these students uh, had a choice whether to go to college or not. College is not right for everybody. It is right for a large number of people. And you're an adult when you go to college. That's what happens during college. You go from being a child to being an adult. Well, part of the uh, becoming an adult is to take on individual responsibility. So if you take on responsibility for a, a, a debt, you want to go to college, you should pay that debt back. Asking taxpayers who many of them have paid back their debts, many of them never went to college, and you're asking them to uh, pay the debt back. It's bad for the economy. It's bad for the student. And I tell my students, this will be the most expensive free thing you'll ever get. And why is that? Because you're right. You'll, it'll be free while for four years while you're going into college because taxpayers will cover the expense. But after you graduate and work, you become a taxpayer. So for the next 45 or 50 years, you'll be paying higher taxes so that other people can go to college. It's a bad deal for you. It's a bad deal for the country. We shouldn't do it. Well, and as we know, taxes are never repealed. They just add up. They just add another one on. So once we get that tax, it will never really go away. I I was interested in hearing what um, <clears throat> what uh, Bernie Sanders had to say about his bill. This is his bill, I guess. And yeah. the people that that stood up with him are interesting as well. Ilan Omar. Uh, Pamela y Jayapal and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as well as the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, they all stood up and said, this is a great idea, Bernie. Uh, I wonder, uh, you know, how do you feel about Ocasio-Cortez, for example? She's got a, a degree in economics. Why would she stand up for something like this? You know, she does, and it's from Boston University, which is certainly an excellent school. She doesn't, she must have slept through part of her class there, because she seems not to have full grasp of the principles. Look, if, you, if we take a look at the big picture here, what you're doing is you're, all of these programs, free health care for everybody, free uh, education for everybody, uh, uh, guaranteed basic income for everybody, all of these things take income away from people that have earned it, and give it to people who haven't earned it. That in itself is going to stagnate the economy. People are not going to continue to earn income if you're going to take it away from them. And people that get things for free are not going to earn income because they're getting it for free. Uh, so it's, it's a terrible idea. The whole concept here, all these socialistic programs are exactly opposite to what made this country great. You know, if you take a look at the big picture for a minute, the U.S. went from the birth of a nation to the number one economy in the world, most prosperous economy in the world in about 150 years. Other countries were hundreds, in some cases thousands of years old, older. How did we do that? In my view, four principles. One, we emphasized individual freedom. So people were free to do what they wanted to do and they can pursue what their interests were. Secondly, individual responsibility. People took care of themselves. They didn't expect someone to take care of you. Thirdly, low rates of taxation. So when you earned income, you got to keep most of what you earned. And fourthly, a limited role 
for government. That took us from the birth of a nation in 150 years to the largest economy in the world. Every one of these socialistic programs is exactly opposite to that. When the government starts paying for something, they're going to control the education, they're going to control the, the uh, health care, you're going to lose individual freedom. The government's taking care of you, you lose individual responsibility and have social responsibility. <clears throat> Instead of low rates of taxation, in order to pay for all this, they're going to eventually tax everybody, so you're going to have higher rates of taxation. <clears throat> and fourthly, you now have the government involved in everything. Those things are exactly opposite to what made the country great. It will stagnate the economy uh, if they continue to push these socialistic views. Well, let's let's change gears just a little, uh, because the uh, universities uh, stand to gain something here. I, you know, it didn't surprise me too much when I saw the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, involved in this, because once the government starts paying the tab, they can raise tuition, can't they? Exactly. <clears throat> the university uh, administrations and professors will strongly favor this. <clears throat> this will guarantee to them at a time when, because birth rates are low, uh, there's a declining a number of students going to, to college. In fact, there's a number of colleges that have had to, to uh, close. Well, college professors say, look, this will enable everybody to, to go to college, even people that are probably not suited to go to college. Since it's free, they'll say, look, let me go. If it doesn't work out, uh, so what? So it will guarantee greater enrollments for the schools and you're right if the government's picking up the tab tab for tuition tuition will just go up high, higher and higher the government is not um motivated to do things on an efficient basis uh, they have different motivations i'm never quite sure what they were but they have different motivations and being efficient is not um one of them so if the cost is going to go up they'll just be okay with that and we end up with another entitlement program that's going to cause chaos. If I can just mention one point about that. We all recognize <clears throat> we have <clears throat> a deficit problem with the federal government budget and a huge public debt. Most of the reason for that <clears throat> is annual spending. We can hardly touch most of it. Why is that? The federal government will spend $4.4 trillion this year, over 60% of it, um, is uh, 2.7 trillion of it, over 60% is in entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. So we can't touch those and we have to get government spending down. Now you wanna add another entitlement program or two to this, we'll get stuck in a position that ends up with a stagnant economy and it could, in the worst case, end up to what you see in countries like uh, Venezuela and Cuba and some of those. Well, but according to Elizabeth Warren, the rich are gonna pay for this. Yeah, unfortunately, there's not enough rich people to go around to pay for this, number one. And again, to my original point, if you keep overtaxing the wealthy, you'll destroy capital formation, and that will stagnate the economy even further. Terrible idea. Let me say one other thing. This student loan debt is not as big a problem as they're making it out to be. The, it, it's true, it's $1.5 trillion, that's true, but... The average student who has debt has about $30,000 worth of debt. Mm -hmm. That's a good number, but the government lets you pay it back over 10 years. The monthly payment is about the size of a car payment. I mean, it's a burden, but it's not an undue burden. So before you go and foul up the entire system because you uh, think you want to help somebody that you're not really going to end up helping, let's work on some other things rather than trying to pay off everybody's loan. Well, and it sounds like they're just going after votes again. It's it's pretty much a pandering thing. We need to go to a break. We're coming to you from the Conservative Commandos Radio Network studios and around the world on the Internet with iHeartRadio, TuneIn, American Political Radio, Leading Edge Radio Network, and AMFM. TV. Uh, we are also on TV. Sorry. We're also on TV with the AUN TV network in Northern California, specifically Nancy Pelosi country, San Francisco and Sacramento. We'll be right back with my co-host Rick Trader. I'm Sharon Engel and our guest Michael Bussler, who is a professor of finance at Stockton University. I saw voter fraud with my own eyes. Now, people say, why didn't you report to the authorities? 
Well, they were the ones doing it. The integrity of one man, one vote doesn't apply at the Texas state legislature. There is no way to know if your representatives are voting for themselves. Hartman, a Republican, reaches back to vote for Democrat Oliveda. Democrat Matt Reynolds votes for Republican England. Two out of three voters nationwide believe that voter fraud is a serious problem in the U.S. today. The process is rigged. Both sides of the aisle are, are guilty. Florida now has to tell the Department of Justice whether the state will comply with DOJ's demand to stop purging thousands of people from its voter rolls. We have the sloppiest election system of any industrialized democracy. Philadelphia flagged 50,000 uh, duplicate registrations, so just think how many more slipped through. It's almost impossible to detect. How do you get caught? You only get caught if you confess. Election corruption is deeply embedded in America. Quote, election fraud is a crime that usually pays, unquote, writes Tracy Campbell in his book, Deliver the Vote, a history of election fraud, an American political tradition from 1742 to 2004. In 1742, the first Prime Minister of Britain in the American colonies, Robert Walpole, was forced to resign. We have a right not to have our vote canceled out by someone who shouldn't be voting, someone who's an illegal alien, someone who's a felon not eligible to vote, someone who doesn't exist. If they vote, they cancel your vote out as much as if you're prevented from voting. This is going to be fixed. It's going to have to be a citizen effort. It comes down to it's the same old question. Uh, if not now, when? If not us, then, then who? This is huge. This is about the democracy and the principles of the United States of America. People say, but why you? Why you? Why, well, well, why not? And if it starts with a fireman, if it starts with a sanitation worker, if it starts with a teacher or a nurse or a caretaker of the elderly, then so be it. It's got to start somewhere. But it's time we come together and fix this problem once and for all. There is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even, you could even rig America's elections. But to say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie. allegations of voter fraud the claims raising questions about the Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and 32 others were on a military plane that crashed today in a violent storm there are no known survivors at this time the US army was funded by the evil entity well, voter fraud with my own eyes to say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie the process is rigged And welcome back. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos radio show. I'm Rick Trader. My co-host today is Sharon Engel. And our guest is Dr. Michael Bustler. He is a public policy analyst and a professor of finance at Stockton University. Michael, thank you for holding through that break. We really do appreciate your time. Uh, Michael, when you... Uh, Earlier in the interview, you were saying to Sharon Hell, you try to educate your students that this free stuff is actually going to cost them. They're going to, they're the ones that are going to get stuck paying for this free stuff. That's unless they intend to get that wonderful degree at Stockton University and collect food stamps, welfare, unemployment, or in other words, be a tax sucker instead of a tax contributor. What is the reaction to you, Dr. Michael Bustler? <clears throat> well, you know, they don't quite see things like that. Uh, <laughs> they just see that uh, there's a big um, income inequality uh, issue mm -hmm. in the U.S. 
they think the reason for that is the people at the top are just greedy and they want to keep all the money away from, from everybody else. Uh, and they think the way to cure that is to take the income away from those that have earned a lot and give it to those who, for whatever reason, haven't earned it. They believe that's fair. Part of the problem is, um, I don't know if this is an exact figure, but I would venture to say probably 90% of university, uh, college, university faculty are very liberal. And um, I know at my school, it's a university, it was started 40-some years ago as a liberal arts college, and they still have a liberal arts uh, slant on things. The faculty um, only present one side of an argument to mm -hmm. the, the students. And as a result of that, they never really understand what the other side is. You know, I tell the students, you, you go to college to learn certain specific things, but you're also there to learn critical thinking skills. So that when you run into a situation where you have to make a decision, you know how to make decisions that will probably be best for you. Well, to make a good decision, we know you have to gather information. And in, if the, your professors are only giving you one side of an argument, you're not getting complete information to make a decision. I always talk to them about, what do you think about raising the minimum wage? And they all say, oh, it's a great thing, raise it to $15 an hour. Well, then I give them the other side, how, you know, the minimum wage um, results in unemployment. Look, the unemployment rate today is rock bottom, 3% uh, for everybody. Teenage unemployment is 15%. Mm. When entering the workforce for the first time, the unemployment rate is 16%. So people who you're trying to help by giving a wage that, in all due respect, is more than the value of their, their output ends up hurting everybody. They want to raise the minimum wage to $15 an, an, an hour. Well, if somebody gets a raise to $15 an hour without doing anything, they would think, well, I don't really have to do anything. I'll just continue to get uh, high wages. So I give them both sides of the argument, and they scratch their head a little bit and start to think about it. So college professors, I think, are doing a disservice to the students by not presenting both sides of the argument. And you're right. Most of them tend to favor programs like this because their professors tell them it's a good thing. Well, you know, Michael, there's a little saying that I love, and it was uh, created by Alex de Tocqueville, all right? And it says, the American Republic will endure until the day Congress discovers they can bribe the public with the public's money. <laughs> and that is what is happening here. And, and so you've got 25 Democrats running around the country trying to get the party's nomination, each of them trying to run to the left of each other with things like free college for all, a living wage, uh, free health care, the, the new Green Deal. And I bring this up to you as... Um, as an economics professor at Stockton University, a little bit of math that was presented to me by Senator Ron Paul the other night at a, at a dinner. He said, well, you know, these kids, they want to tax the rich. Let's hit that top 1%. Let's hit them with a 70% tax. Well, Senator Paul pointed out the flaw in all this that would only bring in about $800 billion. And yet when you, when you total up the new programs, forget the existing debt, forget the existing government obligation to the military and to education and to, and to all the, the, the social programs, taxing the top 1%, 70%, that $800 billion, is not a drop in a bucket. No, it certainly isn't. And uh, so what ends up happening is they'll start taxing the wealthy, realize that there's not enough money there, so they'll start moving down, and they'll keep going down until eventually they're going to have to tax everybody. You're going to have to tax all of the middle class to be able to pay for these programs that they, they want. High tax rates, slow economic growth, and uh, particularly if you... Uh, I've never favored the progressive tax system, but the way it is now, if you want to raise that top bracket up to 70%, there's no incentive for somebody to do any more. I mean, mm -hmm. why, why should, look, I'm successful, I've, I've done well, somebody might say, I have capital to invest, but I'm taking a risk with it, I could lose it, 
even if I'm profitable, the government's going to take 70% of everything I make. It doesn't make sense to me. They're not going to invest, slows economic growth, stagnates okay. the economy. We all, we all end up uh, losing. We're far better off if we go back to the principles of individual freedom, individual responsibility, low rates of taxation, and get the government out of the way. Let the economy and let the American spirit do what it's supposed to do. That's what made us great in the first place. It wasn't until the early 1900s where you started with a, put an income tax on, I think in 1913, started out at 1%. Now look how high it is. 1935, they started with Social Security. That was only 1%. Now it's 12.4% of your wages. You pay half, your employer pays half. There's a proposal to raise it to 14.8%. Mm -hmm. of your uh, wages. Well, then Dr. Bustle, they're, they're just going to find another another way to hide this, another mask, and I'll tell you where it's going to come from, a national sales tax. Which That's is extremely unfair. Sales taxes, anytime you tax consumption, it's a regressive tax, and it hurts the lower income earners the most, simply because they spend all of their income. So, Well, Dr., I, I, I disagree with you. Uh -huh. I would rather see a national sales tax on everything. Eliminate income tax. Let's have a national sales tax on everything. This way, everybody becomes a taxpayer. This way, as Joe Biden would say, everybody now has skin in the game. That this makes is, a lot, a lot of sense. Is, I certainly, I certainly un understand that. The only problem is, the lower income earners will be taxed on every dollar they earn because they're going to spend it all. Upper income earners are only taxed on a small portion. Well, maybe, the, maybe they'll start to hurt. Maybe they'll say, whoa, what about all the free stuff? I'm, there is no free stuff. I'm paying for it. I'm paying for it twice when I go to sir. Doctor, point. I, another point I wanted to point. talk with you about, if you don't mind, sure. is it, maybe, you know, you talk about the, the student debt, the student loans that are in default. Maybe... And we had a guest here on Conservative Commandos last week talking about this. Maybe colleges and universities should be held responsible for part of that debt. And I'll tell you where I'm coming from. My wife is the product of a the state of New Jersey higher education system. She's a, a proud graduate of Glassboro University, which now is now over. Rowan University. And when she went to college... Her tuition for a year was $375. Yes, $375. A couple of years ago, we had a young man working with Sharon and I uh, who went to that same university, was paying about $14,000 a year. Now, mm -hmm. even if you want to say, well, okay, $375, all those years ago, things went up 10 times. Well, that's only... Less that's still less than four thousand dollars, but Matteo, our friend, was paying over fourteen thousand. Also, a doctor, many years ago, I heard a statistic that many years before that, at Rutgers University, which is another state university, the ratio of student to employee at the college was fourteen to one. In other words, for every fourteen students, there was one employee. Right. When I heard this statistic, it was down to three to one. In other words, for every three students, there was now one employee. I say that colleges themselves are largely responsible for this massive student debt, for the, the cost of an education, for teaching kids things that they can't use in the outside world, and for... Too many teachers, too many professors, too much college administration, too much help around the college cutting the grass and pruning the trees. I'll tell you, Rick, Dr. I, Michael Bussler, I, tell me I'm off the wall. You know, I can't. <laughs> I, I agree with you completely. My first term in college cost me $1,200. The entire year was $1,200. And you're, you're right. College administrations have bloated. They now have a, a, a specialist that does virtually everything. Part of the uh, reason for that, or at least some of it, is um, colleges are now very aggressive, aggressively going after students. So they have um, people that they bring in to actively recruit students. The pool is getting a little smaller, so colleges are getting more aggressive. Also, colleges felt that they had to provide a lot more services 
to, to students, counseling services, different clubs, different act activities. Uh, they wanted nicer dorm rooms. So everything has been upgraded. Um, they would argue you get a much more uh, well-rounded college experience, and that may be true, but it is so expensive now that it's causing all, all of these problems. Um, colleges, too, are not concerned about doing things efficiently and at the lowest cost. You know uh, what the problem with education is? It, it's obvious to me the problem with education is there are not more Dr. Michael Bustlers <laughs> out there teaching. Uh, Dr. Michael Bustler, we've got to run. We're up against a hard, hard break. But please tell our audience how they could follow your work and the things that you write. Surely. So my Twitter account is at M Bustler. That's at M B U S L E R. I also have a Facebook page uh, called Funding Democracy. So if you're on your Facebook, just search Funding Democracy. Every one of my columns in both of those spots. Dr. Michael Bustler, always enjoy. I always enjoy having you on the show because I'm thinking at least there's one <laughs> voice of reason out there in, in the college world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you too, Sharon. Everybody wants cheap airfare, but where do you find it? You call low-cost airlines. Their prices are direct from the airlines, and they're so low you can't find these fares published anywhere. They specialize in cheap flights, discount hotel rooms, cheap car rental rates, and great package deals anywhere around the world. Wherever you want to go, they can help you get there cheaply and with the best price guarantee. If you want the lowest prices on your airline tickets or other travel services, call now. That's right, call. That's the only way to get these rates. Experts are standing by 24-7 to get you the cheapest airfare and hotel rates available. So don't wait. Call right now for the lowest travel prices anywhere and for great last-minute travel deals, too. Call 888-431-0562. That's 888-431-0562. 888-431-0562. Friend, do you remember when it felt good to withdraw your cash from the bank to expand a business, go on vacation, or buy a new car? Well, today, withdrawing your own cash has become a very risky business, according to The Secret War, a shocking new research report. I just read it, and folks, I was amazed to learn why banks are now required to spy on us for the government and then report any suspicious or unusual behavior. I suggest you get The Secret War free. Just call the number on the screen, no charge, from the folks at Swiss America and get this. Did you know simply spending cash today may be enough to have you branded as a potential criminal? That's right. The new war on cash is really a war against all freedom-loving Americans. The Secret War is yours free, so call the number on the screen and you can tell them. Pat Boone gave you the number. Welcome, welcome everyone back to the Conservative Commandos, the radio show and the television show. Thanks to the AUN TV network and of course the Conservative Commandos radio network. And always uh, we, you know, we need to give thanks where thanks is due to Al Gore's amazing internet. Uh, <laughs> I hope you catch the sarcasm in my voice as I say that. I always get worried that someone will read a transcript of that. They won't catch the sarcasm and they will think that George, that moron, believes that uh, Al Gore invented the internet. I don't. Don't worry. I'm George Landreth, and uh, I am back for a segment where I get to do uh, an interview, and I am super excited about the interview we get to do now because uh, Steve Moore has just been a champion of conservatism and opportunity and uh, and all the things that I think our founders really uh, promoted. I just want to make sure you know where you can get uh, information about the show or rebroadcast, and then I'm going to introduce Steve. CCRsnetwork.com, CCRshow.com, it's all there. Make sure that you... Uh, Tell your friends about the Conservative Commandos. We'd love to, to have you around. Well, um, you know, it's often said, you know, we don't need to do an introduction. With Stephen Moore, we don't really need to. I have to say, he was the MC at our Reagan Gala just a couple weeks ago. And let me tell you, he was a rock star. He, uh, he just, uh, people were super excited about uh, Steve Moore. They were excited about Rand Paul. We had two uh, just really great champions of liberty there. But I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Steve Moore just so that you... Uh, 
you know, he doesn't need an introduction, but he's going to get one anyhow. Uh, he uh, founded and was the president of the Club for Growth. And they, of course, worked very hard to and continue to do so to elect uh, folks that see growth as an important part of uh, public policy. He's been on the editorial board at the Wall Street Journal. He's at the, he's at the Heritage Foundation. Um, and he, of course, was one of the architects of uh, Donald Trump's uh, tax policy. So, you know, and it, I guarantee you've seen him on the news, you've read his stuff, you know that he is a champion of all the things that uh, someone like when we had the Ronald Reagan Award, uh, that Ronald Reagan would be excited about. And uh, so with that, Steve, welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. Thank you, George. Great to be with you, and congratulations on your great uh, annual uh, dinner there in Washington, D.C. with Rand Paul, who's one of my heroes. Well, thank you, and I have to say thank you for helping make it that way. Um, you know, it wasn't, uh, you were not simply an attendee, you were somebody who made it what it was. So yeah. thanks, uh, just the flavor that you brought to the event, uh, all the things that you, you were able to weave together, wonderful stories from uh, Ronald Reagan's life and Rand Paul, it was just, it was masterful. And the funny right. thing was, is you kind of, you, I, you know, I could tell you were doing it from your head, so it was great. It's, uh, it's nice when you know that somebody has all that going on and can just make it happen. It was awesome. Awesome. Thank you. But um, you know, you've written a really good article about um, you know medical expenses and and the concerns that and it's at town hall for our, our listeners they can look it up. But but what I thought was insightful about it is this: you know, when you and I go to go buy a big screen TV, we can price shop. We know exactly what features we want and what we're willing to pay for and what we don't want to pay for. And 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 if if you'll notice the prices on big screen TVs, they used to be the sorts of things that you had to be super wealthy to afford. Now everybody can afford them, and um, and that's because the power of the marketplace and uh, and all the information, the consumer activity that goes in the marketplace. We haven't seen as much, and I think that's what you get with your article. So I just want to kind of open it up to you to kind of explain to us, you know, what's the difference between say many of the things we're familiar with in the marketplace and medical issues. Well, you know, thanks, George. And I, I tell the story in my article about uh, a few years ago when I had a, a little uh, rip in my shoulder, and uh, the uh, I went to see the doctor, and you know, he said, "Well, you may need uh, you know some surgery here to, to to you know stitch this back together." And I remember I said to the doctor, "Well, how much is that going to cost?" You know, if I have this surgery, and I remember he looked at me and he's like in wonder. He said, "Steve, you're the first time patient in 15 years who's asked me how much it's going to cost." And and then he turned to me and said, I, "Steve, I don't know what it's going to cost." And so my point was, George, when you have a situation where neither the doctor nor the patient knows what these things cost, you've got a real dysfunctional market, and uh, that drives up costs. It's not an accident that healthcare costs have risen like three or four times the rate of inflation over the last 15 years. And that's because you don't have price sensitive consumers and you don't have price information. And so what Donald Trump has proposed, and I'm all for this, and he's done an executive order just this week saying that, um, you know, he wants doctors and hospitals and clinics and emergency rooms and pharmaceutical companies to post their prices. And gee, what a shocking idea that is, right? That you actually would know what something costs before you buy it. And if you add to that, you know, uh, people paying more out of pocket, at least in the upfront, you know, for their medical expenses, we can really bring down, I think, the excessive cost of healthcare and, and still have the highest quality of healthcare in the, in the world. I, I think you're right. I mean, what, it sounds like what you're really essentially suggesting is that we harness the, the advantages and the power of the marketplace in our medical care. Um, just what are some of the things that have caused that to get disjointed? I mean, some of it is that consumers don't really, you know, like when I go to buy a TV, I'm paying for it. Um, but I don't really have the same mechanism with, with uh, there's, it's much more convoluted. That's right. You know, I mean, I, I'm in favor of uh a insurance system for healthcare that does what insurance is supposed to do, which is provide the coverage for a catastrophic event. George, if you break your leg or if you know I get some kind of disease or something where I need uh, you know extensive health coverage, that I'm covered for that, and, and that should include people you know with any kind of pre-existing condition under a family coverage plan. But you know when you're talking about routine expenses, going to the doctor for a physical or other things that you can pay for out of pocket, you know, it should be paid for. Because look, you pay for it one way or the other, right? You're either going to pay for it, you know, writing a check or you're going to write a check to your insurance company for the for the premiums. And you know, it would be a much more efficient system if people just, you know, started to pay attention to what things cost. You know, I most recently had another injury and I had to have an MRI taken. And, you know, I was going to pay for the MRI myself, not through my insurance company. So I called up five or six of the hospitals and I said, you know, what does it cost to get an MRI? And one of them was $600, one of them was $800, one was $400. Guess what, George? I picked the one that's $400. 
$400 and save myself <laughs> some money. You know, that's what we do. You know, it's like when you buy a new car, you don't just say, I like the red sports car, I'll buy it. You ask what it's going to cost. And they may say, you know, that's a $45,000 car. And you say, well, you know, I don't have $45,000. I'll pay $38,000 for it. And you haggle and you get a better price. So we're not seeing that in healthcare, and it really drives up the cost. Absolutely. My interesting. You mentioned the MRI. My wife had the exact same situation where uh, our uh, health plan was canceled. The one we were told we could keep if we liked, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that one was canceled. And so there was a period uh, where we didn't have coverage. So she was basically just going to be paying for it out of pocket, no matter what we did. And um, in the old days, the doctor would give her a script, and she'd just go to wherever he told her to go, and she'd get the MRI. And you know, she'd pay the deductible, and the insurance would pay the rest. But here, we were on the hook for the whole thing, so she's calling around. And the the price variation was staggering. It was actually it was probably it was maybe a few years before your story, but it was it was like double. You know, yeah. it was just amazing. So you're right. If you bother to make a few phone calls, you can find out. But the problem is our system doesn't incentivize that right now. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about uh, the power of markets. Some in some, if we watched the debate last night, you'd almost get the feeling that the business and markets are dirty words. And yet what they've done is make it so that the average person spends less and less of their income on necessities of life like food and other things. And it's, you know, it's, we, we have a very, an amazing standard of living, even available to people who don't consider themselves wealthy in America because of the power of marketplaces. And yet we have some people in politics who somehow think that markets are the problem. I, I, maybe you can just speak to that a little bit as to kind of, you're a champion of markets, so I know you can't speak. I'm just saying, but how do we get to this place where we have people who have just the exact wrong prescription? Boy, it was depressing to watch that debate among the Democrats. It was almost like who, who could give away the most things for free to people. And, of course, Milton Friedman taught us there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. You know, you're going to pay for these things one way or the other. And the idea that it's all going to be free, whether it's free food, free health care, free daycare, free health, you know, all of these things uh, that they want people to have for free. You know, we're going to forgive people for their student loans that they took out. Um, that just passes on the consumer, the cost of these things to other people. And, you know, the middle class is going to have to pay for this because there aren't enough rich people to pay for all of these. I estimate, you know, 50 to $100 trillion of free things they're talking about over the next 20 years. I mean, that's a gigantic price tag. You know, that's, that's uh, you know, double what the national uh, budget is right now. So, uh, you know, <laughs> people, there is inequality in this country. And are, look, we're a rich country. We can make sure that people don't go hungry or homeless or even provide them with health care. But let's do it in a smart way that, that actually doesn't disrupt the marketplace, that is, which, as you know, is the goose that lays the golden eggs. And, you know, one of the lessons I've learned from life, it's pretty simple, is, you know, you know never give something for free to s- someone who can do it themselves. You know, you're not helping people by giving them things. You know, there's old saying, you know, if you teach a man to fish, he he's going to fish for a lifetime. If you give him fish, he'll, he'll uh, eat for a day. And, you know, I, I just I think this idea that everybody's going to be dependent on government is a really frightening concept. Absolutely, I agree. Um, Steve, we're up against the break, so I'm really glad that you'll stick through with us because uh, there's more to talk about. But I do want to remind our listeners that you're listening to the Conservative Commandos, you're viewing the Conservative Commandos. We're coming to you on the Conservative Commandos radio network, the AUN TV network, and of course, always on Al Gore's amazing internet. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more from Steve Moore. AMFM 24 7 Roku channel broadcasts all of our shows on demand. To ensure reliability, we store and stream our content on the same servers as Netflix and Amazon. Our Roku channel is free to use, and anyone owning one of the more than 10 million Roku devices can watch our channel at no cost whatsoever. If you have a television show or are thinking about producing a show, you can be a part of AMFM 24-7's Roku channel. Watch our great shows on your Roku device. It's free and more reliable than cable TV. Are you stuck with a timeshare? Did you attend the presentation and were seduced and enticed into buying that great vacation and investment? Now you're in the terrible position of trying to figure out a way to get out of that mess. You're not alone. For over 15 years, BuyYourTimeshare.com has been helping people like yourself get out of timeshare ownership. The fact is there is no resale market. Unscrupulous telemarketers call you and say they have buyers waiting and the next thing that happens is you give them hundreds of dollars for an ad and you'll never hear from them again. Another fact is that an identical timeshare to yours is being offered on eBay for a dollar and no one is buying it. If you want out of your timeshare, I urge you to go to buyyourtimeshare.com or call them at 877-94-HELP-ME. 
That number again is 877-94-HELP-ME, buyyourtimeshare.com. That's buyyourtimeshare.com, 877-94-HELP-ME. Dish TV is better than cable TV. Here's why. Dish has the nation's lowest TV price, along with an award-winning DVR that can skip commercials, record eight shows at once, and get access to thousands of movies at your fingertips. Cable simply can't even compare. So the smart choice is to cut the cable and get Dish. Plus, you get all these great TV features, free HD DVR upgrade, free installation, and free movie channels. Say goodbye to cable and get more with Dish TV. 877-290-7764. 877-290-7764. As an added bonus, you can switch to Dish now and receive a $50 Visa gift card. So call now and get Dish TV. Call 877-290-7764, 877-290-7764. That's 877-290-7764. Limited time offer, 24-month commitment, and credit qualification required. Cancellation fee, monthly equipment fees, and other restrictions apply. Promotion can change at any time. Welcome back to the Conservative Commandos. We are glad you stayed. I know you will be. We have uh, Steve Moore with us. Uh, I've introduced Steve, but just to remind you, he is... Um, he kind of, well, he was the founder of Club for Growth, but he's a, a, a fellow who champions uh, what I would call this sort of common sense economics, not egghead economics. When you talk to Steve, you understand in real ways where the rubber hits the road, how policies impact regular Americans. And, and his goal has always been to make sure that Americans have uh, the freedom and opportunity that our founders envisioned and that they were hoping for when they laid out the groundwork for this great country. And um, he's been a great champion of that. Um, we were saying earlier in the show and we were teasing this segment that uh, – you were you would have been the perfect addition to the uh, Fed, quite frankly, because um, too many of the people in the Fed are just kind of uh, bankers, but they don't really grasp the concept of growth. And as a father of seven kids with grandkids, I'm kind of hoping there's a growing economy for them. That they, um, you know, the stock market's great, but I just want to make sure the economy grows in healthy ways so that when my kids are finished with their schooling, they can get a job and they don't have to move back in my basement. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, the Fed, I've been a critic of the Fed. I think that they should be more open and more transparent. Uh, you know, this is the most powerful, one of the most powerful agencies of government, if not the most powerful. They have control of our money supply, our interest rates, you know, our savings rates and all of this. And so, uh, you know, what I wanted to see was more transparency, more sunlight in terms of how the Fed makes its decisions. And, um, and to really change the way they operate. I, I believe that the, you know, the role of Fed should be to keep the dollar stable in price. That's why you have a currency. Uh, the reason that you hold dollar bills in your pocket is because you have a confidence that the dollar that you're holding now or the $20 bill or $50 bill is going to be worth uh, pretty much the same you know, a year or two from now as it is today. And, you know, I think right now, actually, the Fed has been too tight. I do think Donald Trump is right that we need one or two rate cuts to get more supply of dollars in the economy. You know, we, we outshifted the supply curve of the U.S. economy with these tax cuts, the deregulation. Uh, and I do worry about a little bit of deflation right now. And you look at the commodities, they're down 10 percent from the, where they were, you know, six months ago when we had 4 percent growth. So uh, I want to see stable prices. I want to see uh, more growth. And, and too many people at the Fed believe that growth causes inflation. And that's just wrong. If you have more economic growth and you're producing more goods and services, the price of goods and services falls. They don't rise. But those kind of mysticisms are prevalent at the, at the uh, Fed. And it was people like Herman Cain and I who were going to take on that uh, that. Uh, those kind of superstitions. And, you know, it's one of the reasons we weren't too popular because we wanted to uh, upset, uh, you know, shake up that that apple cart. Well, that's that's the truth. If only you'd liked women's basketball more. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you began the gala with that, and I thought that was hilarious. It was a great way to, yeah. you know, start with uh, with laughter. Uh, for anybody who missed the first segment, just go to ccrsnetwork.com, ccrshow.com. You can, you know, get a, you can view a, a, a rebroadcast. You can listen to a rebroadcast, whatever you like. Um, Steve, you know, in the first part of this segment, we talked a lot about uh, healthcare and kind of how it got out of whack from the consumer, it kind of the consumers got disconnected from the system so that yeah. they weren't price shoppers. And I guess my question would be, um, how would you see 
Well, if you look at kind of the areas where government's involved, they're involved in healthcare a lot. They're they largely run the system, even though they don't. Uh, it's not quite the you know the English system or the Canadian system. They still have this their tentacles and everything. The only other area I can think of where they really do kind of run a lot of things is education, and both seem to just be. So I, I want to ask you to help us understand why that is, because I thought government was going to make it cheaper, right? Because they're paying for all this stuff, but it's not working out that way. <laughs> yeah, isn't it interesting that the two industries in America where prices are out of control over the last. 20 or 25 years have been healthcare and education, and those are the two industries that are most dominated by government. And when I asked my liberal friends, gee, why do we have the government play such a you know, huge role in education and healthcare? They say, to make it more affordable. Gee, George, they're doing a great job of it, right? I mean, anybody pay a college tuition bill or you know, pay a healthcare bill? So we need to inject market competition into healthcare and education. Uh, you know, we're here in Washington, D.C. You can get a better education at half the cost uh, in the Catholic school system than you can in the public school system. So something's terribly wrong. And our solution to this continues to be, at least the political solution, seems to be keep sending spending more and more money and sending more money into a failed system. And that's just, that's the idea of craziness, right? I mean, why don't we have a new model that allows parents and kids to choose their own schools? So just like you choose what grocery store you want to go into or, you know, uh, what, what do you want to buy on, uh, on uh, Amazon? You know, the government doesn't tell you what you have to buy, and yet in education we do that, and it's a real tragedy. I mean, in, here in uh, Washington, D.C., or where my hometown of Chicago, the inner city public schools are a disgrace. And, I, you know, the, my heart bleeds for those kids who are forced to go to schools that don't teach them. And it's, it's, it's kind of child abuse, really, what's happening. You know, it's, it's a kind of uh, educational child abuse. And we, we've allowed that to go on, George, for, you know, 40 or 50 years now. Yeah. No, you're right. A quick, quick question. Just, um, you know, with your economics background, let's assume that they're right, that that um, these things should be paid for by government and they should just kind of stack up this long, long list of things. Uh, and then we say, so how are they going to pay for it? And we, the, the answer is always the rich. So can the rich, let's assume the rich, um, you know, agree to this. Um, how does it work? Is it possible? Are there enough rich people to pay for this? Well, first of all, this idea that the rich don't pay their fair share is really pretty preposterous. I mean, the top 1% of people in the country in terms of income, you know, they pay about 40% of the income tax. The 1% pay more than 90%, which is amazing. Uh, so, you know, we need more rich people. It, you know, we want people to get rich. And I, it always, you know, it always surprised me. I saw something recently where a number of Democrats uh, running for president said nobody in America should make more than a billion dollars. What are you going to do? Put a hundred percent tax on them when they, you know, get a billion dollars? So somebody like Fred Smith or you know the the people who are so successful, Bill Gates, you're going to, you know, think of all the things that we've been provided by these great companies that were started by people who are now billionaires. You know, why do we want to tax the American dream? But in answer to your question. So even if you take every penny from every millionaire and billionaire in this country, you could maybe fund the government for three months. <laughs> so what that means is you're going to have to take the money from the middle class. We're a middle class country. So we're, we're going to give things away for free to the middle class, and then we're just going to tax them to pay for it. That's, that's a silly solution. Yeah, that is. So so it's not a function of just having them pay five, you know, because they always act like, oh, we, we just want them to pay a little bit more. And, and that's the big lie, because if you took everything... If I understood you correctly, we're saying confiscatory. Just take it. Take it from them. Yeah. And, still and don't have enough it, money. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so 100% tax. Yeah, you know, yeah. because there aren't enough rich people. I mean, you know, this is a middle class country. 75% of us are in the middle class. And, and you know, we pay our taxes. And I, play, I know you, I pay a lot of taxes. And, uh, you know, I, there, all these free <laughs> things, Medicare for all, student loan repayment. I mean, this is another one that gets me, George. How is it? That we're going to just relieve, you know, taxpayers are going to pay $1.6 trillion for student loans that these kids and their families took out voluntarily. And, and then how is that fair to the people who paid their student loans, who actually made yeah. the financial sacrifice to pay the loans? How is it fair to people who didn't go to college that they now have to pay higher taxes for kids who did go to college? I mean, I, I don't really understand the logic of that one either. Yeah, and another generation they'll want reparations to the people who had to pay. <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, this is crazy stuff. Well, you know, we've got uh, the G20 coming up, and, and it, it's probably not fair to ask you this, but in, and basically in a minute or so, what, what do you think is going to come out of the G20? What's the importance of this weekend? Well, I sure would love to see a, a, a trade deal, wouldn't you, with uh, China and the United States. I know we talked about this at your conference. You know, I happen to agree with Trump that 
I think uh, you know we are, we do need to get tough with China. I'm a free trade guy, you know that. I, I don't like tariffs. I, I want free trade, but you know we got an abusive relationship with China right now, and they are out out of control. I think it's a situation where they've become a genuine menace, uh, you know, both uh, economically and. Uh, in terms of what they're doing is from a security standpoint. And we need to get China to stand down. And, you know, if Trump can pull this out and we can get China to lower their tariffs and stop stealing our intellectual property and, you know, start acting like, a, you know, the second largest economy that they are and stop, you know, being so abusive. I mean, we've opened up our markets to them. They, they just haven't opened up our markets to us. And that has hurt a lot of American farmers and manufacturers. And so if we can get a trade deal, I think it's going to be the best thing you ever saw for the American economy. I think you think the economy is good now. Wait till we get a trade deal with China. But the ball right now is in Beijing's court. They're going to have to make some concessions because Trump is not going to back down here, nor should he. Right, and their economy is hurting, so they're under pressure to 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 quite frankly make some uh, make some moves, don't you think? Sorry, I say I think their their economy is in trouble right now. The it Chinese, is. That's so they, not they being should reported. be motivated. Yeah, that's not being reported. Everybody's talking about how the tariffs are hurting the United States, and they are. Tariffs do hurt Americans, yeah. but they are hurting the Chinese far more. China's economy is in a lot of trouble right now, and that's why I do think Trump will prevail. You're seeing a lot of factories move out of China now. They're going to Japan. They're going to India. They're going to other countries to avoid those tariffs. China's going to have to, I think, make some real concessions here. And by the way, it would be good for both countries, both Absolutely. countries to yeah. get this it's done. It's win-win. That's how trade is. It's win-win. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, again, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago you hit a grand slam, and uh, again today you have. You are a uh, you hit with uh, for high average and with power. So I appreciate it. That's great. <laughs> thank so, you. Nice uh, compliment. Have absolutely. a great weekend, my friend. Take care. Absolutely. You're listening to Conservative Commandos. I'm George Landreth, and uh, we will be back right after these messages. Have you been leasing a property for your business or renting storage space? Are you tired of paying rent year after year? Call the experts at General Steel to own a building at up to 30% off now. I'd been renting a building and paying someone else's mortgage, but General Steel showed me how I could own a space tailored to the needs of my business and for less than renting. Call General Steel now at the number on your screen for our current building specials and to price your metal building system today. My building's the dream I've had since finishing my house 14 years ago. I've been using it for a garage, workshop, and storage area for my tools and equipment, and I can't believe how great it turned out. The economy is improving, and the price of steel is expected to rise. Stop waiting. It could cost you thousands. Call General Steel now to see how you can own for less than you thought. Stop waiting to start your business or expand your operation. Call General Steel now. Call 877-484-7002. allegations of voter fraud, the claims raising questions about the... Commerce Secretary Ron Brown and 32 others were on a military plane that crashed today in a violent storm. There are no known survivors at this time. The U.S. Army was funded by the evil entity. Or voter fraud with my own eyes. To say that it doesn't exist is an outright lie. The process is rigged. to run we gotta go take care god bless we'll see you tomorrow on tv and on radio